Well, we got time. All right, all right, all right I'll do it. Seems now we got a captivated audience. Brother Michael, don't you let nobody out that back door, brother. Um, nice thing. I don't get opportunity to do that very often. You'll understand more as I continue <laughs> on. But uh, I like to sing. I like to play the only thing I can really play. I, I like to. I like to do it. I'm not good at it, but I like to do it. And uh, a fellow gave me this in California. It's about an eighty-dollar harmonica. I. Uh, I buy two dollar and fifty cent Kmart specials myself, but a fella gave me this one, and I'll play a song for you if I can remember how it goes. Uh, it's a good missionary song. Uh, it says, "My father's house is full, but uh, my fields are empty. Who will go and work for me today?" song that uh, I uh, learned. I'll sing it for you, Acapulco, all right? Or uh, Pello, I guess it does. Yeah. song that I heard an old preacher sing a long time ago about, I think I told the preacher ten years ago, it's probably further than that, but an old preacher from North Carolina sung this song, and it really, really got a hold of me when I heard it. It goes like this. Well, the champion marched for 40 days, saying, send me a man to fight. Well, the Israelites said, we've got a brave heart, but our feet are full of fright. Then a boy with a sling and a pocket full of rocks that knew how to trust and pray. He said, Goliath, if you're going to run, you better go now, because I came here to stay. Run if you want to, hide if you will, but I came here to stay. If I fall down, I'm going to try to get up, cause I didn't start out to play. Well, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, hide if you will, but I came here to stay. Now the boys wouldn't bow and the king got mad and he said, Turn the furnace up hot, tie them up and throw them in. You Hebrew boys are going to fry. But a little while later when he looked in the furnace and he heard old Shadrach say, Well, pull up a chair, king, and warm your hands, because we came here to stay. Run if you want to, hide if you will, but I came here to stay. If I fall down, I'm going to try to get up, because I didn't start out to play. Well, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. 
Run if you want to, hide if you will, but I came here to stay. Now the decree was signed by the hand of the king, but Daniel still prayed to the Lord. The hungry lions are pacing the den, and here comes supper one roared. But had you have been around anywhere near, you would have heard Daniel say, Well, if you're thinking about me, you can forget it, boys, because I came here to stay. Run if you want to, hide if you will, but I came here to stay. If I fall down, I'm going to try to get up, cause I didn't start out to play. Well, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to. Hide if you will, but I came here to stay. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles to Daniel, in chapter number 3. And I want to preach to you tonight about some fellows that came to stay. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The title of the message tonight is A Lesson in Fortitude. <clears throat> lesson in Fortitude. We'll see what these gentlemen can teach us tonight. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. So you got a statue 60 cubits tall, six cubits wide, at least at the base. It says he set it up in the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent together together the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges and the treasurers and the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the providences to come to the dedica dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs and the rulers of the providences were gathered together under the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship, uh, worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Let's pray. Our Father, again we thank you today for uh, the blessed Holy Spirit of God that has been so faithful to meet with us every night. Uh, Lord, we may have not seen as much uh, uh, visual results as we might like, but I realize, Lord, there are some things we never get satisfied about. Oh, Lord, if there had been ten saved these three days, we'd have wished there would have been twenty. But, Father, I know it would take an eternity to show forth all that was accomplished in the hearts of your people. Now, I pray tonight, this last service, that you'll bless in a mighty way. I pray you'll speak to hearts. I pray, Lord, if there be any here that's lost, that this will be the day they'll come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I pray, Father, for that one that might be drawn a little cold and drawn away from you. I pray you'd rekindle the fires of fellowship in their soul and put them back on the firing line for God. Now bless this church. Bless the pastor. Thank you, Lord, for the open door and the opportunity to stand here in his pulpit and to preach. Now bless us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Now, as I said, the, lesson, the message is a lesson in fortitude. And, beloved, really, the, the, the need of the hour in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is for some old-fashioned, some old-fashioned fortitude. Preacher friend of mine, Dr. Mel Rudder, known affectionately by all the missionaries at Maranatha as Uncle Mel, puts it another way. He calls it old-fashioned stick to itiveness. And uh, call it what you may, but my, how we need some of that old-fashioned fortitude. And I want to talk to you about these three gentlemen, but before we do, really to understand this, as a lot of passages in the Scripture, it's necessary to just get a little background back from where they came from. Now, you remember back in chapter number one of the book of Daniel, uh, it's back about to 605 B.C., depending a few years this way or that way, whichever... Uh, 
uh, person you take their chronological order from, but about 605 B.C., there's a king called Jehoiakim, and God sent Nebuchadnezzar up against uh, the nation, and it says that the Lord delivered Jehoiakim into his hand. And he carried away captive uh, many of the people. He took many of the princes of uh, the seed of the king, those that were wise, those that were the, the, the wise people, the scientists of that day. And uh, Daniel was in that group. There were four gentlemen over there in chapter 1, you find, that were carried away. There was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, all of these men, of course, had their names changed. Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar. Then, of course, uh, Hananiah's name was changed to Shadrach. Mishael's name was changed to Meshach. And Azariah's name was changed to Abednego. And these, uh, uh, of course, the three fellows we've come to know them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and uh, they were taken captive. They were carried down, to, uh, uh, down there to Babylon, and they were uh, in exile down there. But th what they were going to do, they were going to train these men and just make Chaldeans out of these men. Well, you recall the story how that they refused to eat the king's meat. Uh, they wanted to, to keep their self pure. And the eunuch went ahead and went along with them. And the Bible said that God blessed these men. And then a little while later, about a couple years later, down about to 603 B.C., we find that in chapter 2 the king had a dream. My, what a dream it was. Uh, matter of fact, the pastor already in his revelation class has touched on it and, of course, uh, taking care of those prophetical points of that dream that he had. But he had a dream, and when he awoke, he couldn't remember exactly what he had dreamed. So he called all of his astrologers, his soothsayers, all of those wise men together, and he said, I want you to tell me and interpret this dream. Well, they said, King, just tell us what it is. We'd be glad to. He said, there's only one catch. He said, I, I don't recall rightly what it was. They said, King, you've asked a hard thing. Nobody, nobody can do that but the gods. And so they, they were going to kill all the astrologers. Well, Daniel and his three fellows, his three friends, they got off and they prayed. And, of course, God knows all the secrets, and God told Daniel the dream and the interpretation thereof. And he said, O king, thou art a king forever. He said, that, uh, In your, your dream you saw an image and said whose head was a head of gold. And then he went down to the shoulders, you know, the silver and the brass and so forth, down to the feet that were iron mixed with clay. And he said, O king, said, you're a king. And he said, God's raised you up and said, you're this head of gold. And then he went on to mention the rest of the, the, the particular statue and the interpretation of the dream. Well, that's very good. The king was very excited about that. And he rewarded Daniel. Of course, uh, Daniel, I think, maybe got in a little trouble over there toward the end of the chapter when he let this fellow bow down in front of him and all. But be that as it may, he got a reward. And the king set him up to be kind of a chief governor in the whole province. But Daniel, not like some folks that we know nowadays, I mean, you know, some fellows, when they're nobody, they got a lot of friends, but when they make it to the big time, they forget about the little folks that helped them get there. And But that wasn't so with Daniel. He requested for his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they also be given a position. And they were made governors in the land. And then we come to chapter number 3. Now we're talking about 585 B.C. We're talking somewhere between 15 and 20 years between chapter 3 and chapter 2. These gentlemen have been on the gravy train for all these years. There they were, if you can imagine. Imagine that place yourself. If uh, the Russians were to come here tonight and carry us away captive, supposing they came and they took your wife and your children and uh, destroyed your home, burned it to the ground, and then carried you, separated you from your family, separated Separated you from your precious wife and those little children and carried you off to Russia somewhere to Moscow and uh, carried you away over there. Imagine the state of your mind and what it would be like. And yet God blessed these men and God elevated these men in the land of their exile and no doubt they were enjoying more executive privilege now than they probably enjoyed in their own hometown. They were, they were governors. I mean, they had the secretaries, brother. They had everything that went along with it back in those days. But now they've been riding the gravy train, if I could use the expression, they've been living high on the hog for these Jews. And now comes the time, though, when God in His divine providence and His divine will, He allows Satan now to move in. I mean, 
Satan's upset about this situation. Anytime God's people, brother, when they're, when the Lord's blessing, the devil don't like it. And so he, uh, God allowed him now to come in and he begins to try these men and test these men. And we find that these men were, uh, were true, brother. They were, they were a hundred percent. I mean, they didn't compromise to get their position and they didn't compromise to keep it after they had it. I mean, they took the position because God had elevated them and given it to them. But when the chips were down, they weren't going to compromise to keep that position. Many times, some people, when they get a place of station of honor, they start to cut corners. They begin to shave things here and shave things there and kind of start watering this down and watering that down so they can keep that position, but not so with these gentlemen. Now, I want to give you here just a quick outline and share with you some things because, you see, the devil works the same today as he did back yonder. He hadn't changed his operation a bit. I mean, he works the same old way, same principles, the same old bag of tricks. He just maybe will pull a new one out here and there that we think is new, but he's used it before. And the, 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 the principles involved here are things that you and I will face every day in our Christian life. First of all, we find here in verse number one, we find the dimensions. Uh, we find the dimensions of Satan's devices. Now, remember. Satan is in now Satan is trying to trip up some men. He's trying to get some fellows and he's trying to ruin them. So when he sets out to do it, he goes whole hog. I mean, look at the size of this thing. It says Nebuchadnezzar the king, he made an image of gold. Now, what do you imagine that that thing was worth in our day and time in our uh, system of counting money if it were pure gold? I don't know. I, I imagine it was pure gold. But anyway, the Bible said that it was 60 cubits, three score cubits tall, and it says the breadth are of six cubits. Work that out. It works out to be about 90 feet tall and about nine feet wide at the base. And it's made out of gold. Brother, when the devil sets out to damn a soul in hell, or when he sets out to trip up one of God's people, he spares no expense whatsoever. I mean, the world, when they do something up, brother, they do it up fine and Jim Dandy. They go all the way with it. I mean, these rock stars and so forth, when they do up some of those concerts they have to uh, just to ruin the minds of young people and corrupt their morals. They don't go out there and spend five thousand dollars, not ten thousand dollars. Why I read in the paper somewhere where one set on the, some group, I don't know, they look like some kind of booger bears. I never seen them like before in my life. But they spent over three hundred thousand dollars for one time, and I can understand why. I was out to you know the, the the evidence that our culture is dying, that our culture is rotten to the core, is what you can find that passes off for art and for music. I mean, brother, when when stuff that passes, I'm telling you what's the truth. I was in uh, Hudson, J. L. Hudson, with my wife one time. We came up there having an art show. We got off of the uh, escalator there and walked up. I was looking at this big painting. The fellow had a I think, $750 price tag on it, and I was looking at it. I told my wife, I said, "Honey, look at that." mess on that wall. I said, somebody got to be a slap out fool to pay $750 for that. Well, this fellow walked up behind me in a tuxedo and a silk tie. And he said, uh, I was looking at that thing. I was just giving it down the road. You know, I mean, it would, that just looked terrible to me. And he said, I can tell, he said, that you don't appreciate good art. I said, your foot. I appreciate good art as next gives the next fella. But I said, that stuff there. I said, well, you can't call it garbage, $750 worth. I said, it's garbage. Yeah. See, that's the difference between garbage and garbage. You know, that's expensive garbage. But I mean, just, I, I told him, I said, look here, I could paint something like that. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll save you some money. I said, I'll buy my own canvas and get me some ketchup and some mustard and some black paint and take my shoe off and throw a squirt a little ketchup there and hit a little mustard out there, slop some black paint on it, and get on it with my foot and just rub it in there. And I said, I'll hang them all over here and I'll sell them for a hundred bucks a piece. We can make a deal. And you know, my mother, mama, she's pulling my coat. She says, honey, let's, let's go now. Let's go. I said, what do you mean go? I said, look at this girl trying to pawn that off for art. I mean, if you want to see real art, look something Rembrandt done, all right? Or Norman Rockwell, some of those fellows. That's art. Now I know I, I can't draw stick figures myself, but I'll tell you what, I know art when I see art, even if I can't do it. And music the same way. Well, that, that, that group, I think it's uh, K-I-S-S or something, you know. And look, oh, I mean, just looked like something out of uh, something out of hell. I never seen anything like it. I was at my mother-in-law's house, and uh, uh, we was there, and I, I caught the evening news, and I went off to bed. Boy, she come running, she knocked on the door, she said, she said, Jim, come here, come here, come here, you got to see this. I went back in there, and, and they had this group on television. 
And uh, I, I said, I'd never seen them before. I said, what in the world? What is that, the Twilight Zone or something like that? I mean, one fellow's got a big white star over here, and one guy's got cat whiskers out here. One fellow got a tongue, man. I'm telling you what's the truth. That fellow could lap out and knock a, knock a fly off the preacher's nose standing up here. I mean, just poop. I, I think he curls it up in there somehow. i never seen anything like it. And the blood's coming down his mouth, and they're up there, and smoke belching out of that big thing they had back there. And one fellow's on the piano, he's playing it like this. Boom, boom, boom. The other fellow's playing that guitar. Boom, 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 boom. And then finally took the guitar and smashing it on the thing. And all, I, you know, and then they took a camera scene and panned it out in the audience. Oh, all those girls there, tearing their clothes and everything. I said, my goodness, that's as demonic as it can possibly be. I mean, but when the world does something, brother, they do it up. I mean, they don't spare any expense. Three hundred thousand dollars that set cost, and all just to blow it all sky high. Before they got done, it wasn't worth anything. I mean, that guy probably took a, a five thousand dollar guitar and busted it all to pieces. But when the devil sets out to do something, he doesn't spare any expense. Now, brother, let me encourage you. Don't you be a piker on God. Don't be a piker on God. I, I've been to some churches, and I've heard of some churches. They have, I, they, boy, they got all kind of cake bait sales and this kind of sale. Use BVD sales, and people just bring their leftover garbage to God's house and try and pay. Listen, if I couldn't pay the bills without going into the rummage business, I'd go out of business and just shut the doors and forget the whole work. Don't be a piker on God. I'm not in for a lot of foolishness and, and a lot of presumption. But, brother, if you'll just do what God tells you to do, all the needs will be met. This, this uh, Nebuchadnezzar here, he wasn't worried about the cost. He wasn't worried about it at all. He took this thing, and brother, he did it upright. And now here are these three fellows. I imagine they, they know something's in the workings here. I imagine they got a feeling here that something's about ready to come off. And it is. Notice now he begins to make his satanic demands on these Christian folk, these fellows that was uh, serving God, these Jews here. Notice in verse 4, it says, A uh, herald went out, and he cried aloud to you at his command. Did, O people and nations and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalter, dual simmer, and all kinds of music, that you fall down and worship the golden image which Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Now he begins to make some unreasonable demands on God's people. I mean, brother, we don't have any business doing what the devil tells us to do, but he'll make the demands. If you're foolish enough to jump to the tune, he'll make the demands. He'd chase you up a tree if you let him. Now, the Bible said in the book of uh, John, chapter 8, says, If the Son hath made you free, set you free, then you're free indeed. And the Bible tells us that Jesus came, that we might have life, and that we might have it more abundantly. But, beloved, some of God's people, the devil snaps the whip, and they say, How high you want me to jump? Listen to me, folks. We don't have any business listening to the devil. We don't have any business fooling around with the devil or doing what the devil's bidding would have us. In many churches, the devil, you know, he'll get folks stirred up, and most of the time they don't even realize it's the devil. That's the way he works the best. If he can take, just kind of stay in the, in, the, in, the, in the back in the back and get things going because he needs darkness to work and get somebody thinking they're working for God and get somebody thinking they're doing something for God and get some of the, you know, it's like, I'll tell you what, some of these faith healers, they believe they're working for God. I, I believe they think they're working for God. And if he can get folks deceived and working for him, let me tell you something. He'd rather use one Christian than to use 10,000 lost people. If he can just get one Christian to use, he'd be happy for years and years if he just get one Christian in one church to use. I mean, then he'll get them down there, you know, and he'll get them to stir up a big mess, and he'll hand them the stick, and then he'll go out and sit on a hill and laugh while the whole works falls in and contention and strife is, is rampant. But, beloved, he begins to make demands out of us. He'll make demands in your home that are unreasonable. Let me tell you something. You don't have to listen to what Satan says. I mean, the devil says, well, you got to have television. I mean, you got to do this, and you got to do that, and he'll tell you, you got to dress like the world. you got to look like like the world. you got to bring your children up like the world. I think some Christians got the idea somewhere that, you know, you need just a little bit of sin to be normal. Beloved, I know we sin. God knows that we're not perfect, and I know we sin. But you don't have to sin. We don't have to sin. The Bible said that we're, we, we know that we sin. We're sinful beings saved by the grace of God. And I know we sin, but we don't have to. And the devil will tell you that, well, you know, the best way to raise your children is by old 
old Dr. Spock. Let me tell you something. That buzzer's going to die and split hell wide open. If you ain't got any better sense than to go by his book over this book, you're crazier than I thought you was. Brother, Dr. Spock don't know what he's talking about. God knows what he's talking about. He's the one that makes those little children, and God knows more about it than he does. I'll tell you what. The only kind of dancing I allow around my house is called the peach tree trot. I learned that dance step very well when I was at home. My father, we had a peach tree. I think it didn't grow any peaches till me and my brother left home. But it's called the peach tree trot. And then there's another one, a real good fancy step, high step in tune. It's called the hairbrush shuffle. And brother, that'll work wonders. That'll work wonders for just about anybody. I can remember when I was at home, I got my last whipping from my father when I was 17 years old. 17 years old. Humiliated me something terrible. But I took it. I took it. That wasn't half as bad as the last whipping I got from my mother. I was 18 years old, brother, when I got that one. I was in the Navy. I mean, I'd done left home. I came home on leave one day, and I was at home, and boy, I was, you know, I'm, man, I'm a big fella now, Mom. You don't tell me what to do, you know. But I was there, and my dad was working swing shift, and my mother came down to the basement. She said, now, son, see, you're going to have to come in just a little bit earlier or be a little bit more quieter when you come in. So your dad's got to get up and has to go to work. And, 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 and I turned, and I said, now, look here, Mom. Now, ho, ho, ho. Wait just a minute now. I said, uh, I'm a big man now. I said, I am I on my own. I don't take no orders from you no more. I said, I'll go when I get ready to, and I'll come when I get ready to. And my knees almost started shaking. I'd never talked to my mother like that in my entire life. My mother wouldn't weigh 90 pounds, soaking wet, about five foot tall. And she turned around and walked away. I thought, well, she's going away to cry, you know. I said, I'm, I'm tough, though. I'm tough, man. I ain't going to bother me none. All of a sudden, I heard something come up behind me, and she went to find her broom. And she had that room handled, and brother, she began to work me over. She said, all right, big man, stay here, take this beating like a man. And she commenced to beat me all clean all over that basement down there, broke that broom over my back, and then when she got all done, she said, now you go out there and buy me a new broom before your daddy gets home. She said, preacher, what'd you do? I went out and bought a new broom before my daddy got home. exactly what I'd done. Brother, you should have heard the stories. Preacher thinks I told some stories. He said, you should have heard the stories I told them sailors when I got back to the base and they're taking a shower and all them bruises all over me. I mean, I made up some of the wildest tales you ever heard. I ain't never, uh, ain't none to this day knows exactly how I came by those bruises, but I told him, I said, man, I was surrounded. I said, you should have seen it. That was the biggest fight of the year. I said, it must have been 12 to 1. I said, they had me back up to the wall. I said, boy, I could have used some help, but I said, I had to go up myself. And well, I just, just told some barefaced lies, but it was better than the truth was anyway. My brethren, in your home, let me tell you something. I thank God. I thank God a thousand times over for my blessed mother that, that, that wore me out when I needed it, and for my father that loved me enough to correct me. And I know I never got enough of them while I was home. I know I didn't get enough of them, even the last one I got. And if I was home today, if my father's soul was going to do it, I'd, I guess I'd take it. I mean, I'd either take it or just get up and leave one of the two. But I, I, I never the furthest thing from my mind would be to raise my hand to my mother or my father. I, that's a, I couldn't even imagine something like that. But, beloved, today they've got this humanism. they got all these better ways to do it. There was a lady in my church up in Alaska, and she brought me this little pamphlet that she picked up one Sunday morning. She said, Preacher, I thought you could use a little hilarity here, and I'd give you this little thing here. And I began to read it by some Dr. E. Flew Fluffy Head, you know, bottle stopper, you know. And I got to reading that thing, and he said, Now, the first thing about raising children that you've got to understand is that children do not misbehave. I said, well, you nincompoop, you've never been to my house. <laughs> he said, they just act in ways that are, their behavior patterns are just in ways that are not suiting to what you think they ought to be. I said, you're a fool. I said, I wonder how a man got so dumb in that short length of time. That's what's wrong with our world, beloved. That's what's wrong with our homes. I mean, brother, go by the book and don't let the devil trick you into thinking that the best way of doing it is like the world says to do it. I don't care if everybody is doing it. Man. It's not the best way to do it. Man. Boy, he'll get us in our homes. 
He'll get us in our dress, in our deportment. I mean, you mark it down. It's hard to date. It's hard to tell the, the fellas from the, from the girls anymore. I'm, I'm being honest about that. I had a clipping an old preacher gave me years ago, and this, it doesn't make the newspapers anymore. There's these two queer fellas getting married. And the, this preacher, I don't know what he was, a Whiskopalian or something was up there, and he was marrying these two fellas, and it was a back shot from the preacher looking down at these two guys. And I don't know, I could just imagine what he was saying. Well, whatever you are, take whatever this is, to be whatever you're going to be, I now pronounce you it. You know, I, I don't know what he is. I don't know. I mean, they, you don't know if they're she's, you don't know if they're him, hymns. I just call them shims for short. You know, I don't, I don't know what they are, beloved. And, and it's amazing, though. It's amazing how, you know, there was a time when a, nothing but a queer wears hair long. But not anymore. Why, well, you see some preachers running over there. But I'll tell you what, I'd just soon shave my head bald-headed and paint it black and go around disguised as an eight ball lest somebody mistake me for a low-down hippie or a low-down queer. Yeah. So they're gay. They are not gay. I'll tell you what, a better term, a sodomite. That's what God calls them, a feminine sodomite. But they're faggot queers in our vernacular. That's what they are. That's what they will be. And they're going to hell. And we don't need to play games about it, beloved. We need to see it for what it is and realize that our country is going down the tubes very fast unless God's people get some fortitude to stand up and say we're going to do it like God wants to do it. I mean, beloved, if God made you a man, then be a man, amen. If God made you a woman, then be a woman. When I mean, you got a little boy, teach that fellow how to teach him how to throw a ball. There's a there's a young fellow I was working with him, and uh, oh, you, I guess so aggravate him sometimes. He's about now he's about 19, I guess. But I was trying to help him. He walked like a little girl. Like that. I said, I said, what am I going to do with this guy? I said, I don't know. I got him out, and I was trying to teach him how to throw a baseball. He throw it like this. I said, now look at here, son. I said, let me show you how to do this. I said, get a hold of that ball. I mean, get a hold of it like you know what you're doing, even if you don't. I said, then take that thing. I mean, squeeze it just like you're trying to hurt it, you know. And I said, then get I said, get a scowl on your face. That always sights me. I said, just get the meanest look you can get. And then take that ball. And then I said, rear it back with that thing. And I mean, brother, let it go. <laughs> Throw it like you're throwing it somewhere, you know. Best he could go. As best he ever got. I finally gave up on that fella. But brother, if you got a little boy, teach him, teach him, teach him, teach him how to be a man. Some queer woman or something, teach him how to be a man. And if you got a, if you got a precious little girl, ladies, you teach her how to be a woman. You teach her how to be a lady. You teach her what God expects out of a lady. You teach her to be delicate. That's nothing wrong with a woman be, being feminine. This little girl's down there working there, and I was looking around at some of the stuff, and she said, Preacher, she said, I've got just the thing for you. I said, Well, what is it? She said, look at this. And she brought this necklace, a little gold necklace. I said, do I look like a man that would wear a necklace? I said, now, come on, ma'am. I said, good night. I said, I, I wouldn't wear one of them things to dogfight. A necklace. Can you imagine it? She said, well, preacher, that's the thing. Everybody's doing it. I said, oh, no, everybody ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. I said, what, you got some ankle chains back there, too? I said, how many of them things you sell, brother? I'll tell you what, I believe a man would wear a necklace and wear an ankle chain before he gets done. Matter of fact, I, I saw that theory I saw that theory proved out one time in Seattle, Washington. There's one of these uh, fellows come by, you know, he had a shoulder bag on, you know, nice looking uh, goatee here, you know, and he's walking down the sidewalk, had on these kind of shoes women wear. Uh, they look right pretty on a woman, but on well, a woman, but boy, on him, they, I mean, his old knobby knees sticking out of them old cut off pants, oh, it looked awful. And then I was watching him walk down the street, I thought, oh. Oh, Lord, I miss you on a puke watching that thing there. And lo and behold, down there on his ankle, he didn't have no socks on, you know. And down on his ankle, if he didn't have an ankle chain on, my name ain't Jim White. I said, there, I said, one of the brothers from the church was down with me. We were bringing a van up to Alaska. I said, Brother Tom, I said, now look at right there. I said, there is the proof of my theory. I said, that low-down queer going there has got one of them ankle chains on. And I said, look up there, he's got one of them necklaces, a matching set. Now, I'll tell you what, brother, this ain't going much too far. If God made you a man, then thanks be to God, be a man. Be a man. Teach your boy how to be a man. Teach him how to walk like a man. I mean, when he walks, teach him to walk like he knows where he's going. Teach him to walk like he's going somewhere and that like he's going to do something when he gets there. And ladies, you teach that young girl how to walk like a lady, not like a street walker, not like a man. Teach her how to walk like a lady. 
And enough of this mess going on. But the devil make demands. And all you, she says, oh, you got to do this. you got to do that. No, you don't have to do nothing. All you have to do is stand before the judgment seat of God one day, one place. That's why I say, oh, you got to pay your taxes. No, you don't. If you're smart enough, you can get out of that. Say you got to die. No, if you're saved, you might not die. But you'll not escape that judgment seat. You must stand before that judgment seat. And then we're going to hurry right along. Notice also there was the sure detection. If you're going to serve God, brother, you're, not, you're, not, you're going to be found out. God will see to it that you're found out. Look in verse 12. Verse 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. says they, uh, they said, Now, King, uh, you know, you made this decree. So we got some bad news for you. Look in verse 12. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee, nor they serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar said in his uh, then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Sure detection, brother. If you're gonna if you're gonna serve God, especially in days of apostasy, I mean when everybody's doing it. Can you imagine what it looked like out there on that plain when everybody Everybody bowed down except three men standing bolt upright. Man. Brother, I'll tell you what is the bunning of the tares comes, and as this situation goes on and it goes further, those folk that really stand for God are going to stand out like a sore thumb. We're going to look so odd and peculiar. It's going to be something else as Jesus tarries His coming. But these men, they got found out. If you're going to stand for God, you will be found out. But don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I mean, the first thing they did notice, they gave Him an invitation to deviate from the Word of God. He said, now look at fellas. Is it true? Is it true that you won't bow down? He said, now listen. If you'll bow down when they blow that flute and the harp and so forth, if you'll bow down, He says, well, but... If not, he said, we're going to chuck you in the fire, boys. Now you better think it over. But notice the determination of the saints. Oh, look down in verse number 16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able. And notice there's there no period there. That thing goes on. But you know all of us here know that. I mean, who's the man, who's the woman, where's the boy or girl that won't admit that God is able? He's able to deliver me. He's able. And they said, King, we know that the God that we serve is able to deliver us. That's fine. Amen. But they went a step further. They said, went on to say, He's able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and He will deliver us out of thine hand, O King, but if not... Now, you got, I mean to appreciate the, the courage of these three men. They just told the king. Now, remember, these are not gutter bums. These fellows have been enjoyed for the last few years executive privilege. They sit there as governors. They've been rulers in the land. They have enjoyed executive privilege. They have sat in the king's palace. They've been right up there with the heads of state. And now it's all on the line. And the devil says, all right, fellas, if you're going to ride the gravy train anymore, you're going to have to pay the price. Now, no doubt the devil came and tempted these men. Oh, I imagine he said, now look, Shadrach, you better think this thing over. He said, you know, that fire is going to be awful hot. And you're going to roast in there just like a slab of bacon. You'll boil in that fire. You better think it over. I mean, I imagine he said, I've been to go. You better, you better not stick with these two fanatics. They'll get you killed. You better bend. You better bow. But they wouldn't. They wouldn't bend. They wouldn't bow later on. They didn't even burn, brother. Amen. They wouldn't do it. But the devil said, go do it. I mean, I mean, he said, now look, why don't you just, you know, you can kneel down. Just kneel down there on one knee, shut one eye, and pretend. Nobody knows the difference. And while they're all praying to Baal, you can pray to the God of heaven. And nobody knows the difference, but no, they wouldn't take it. They said, oh, King, we know that our God whom we serve is able. I mean, brother, they were determined. They had determination, and they were willing to stand for God. And they said, we know that our God's able, but even if he doesn't, Mr. King, we still ain't going to bow. How you like them apples? Said, we're not going to do it. So we know God's able, but even if He doesn't deliver us, we will not bow. 
And beloved, how we need some old-fashioned Holy Ghost determination from God's people. Let me tell you something. You know and I know that God's able. What if God doesn't, though? Would you be willing to go? I mean, God's able to put food on your table. But would you go if He wouldn't do it? God's able to protect you. But would you go if you, if He didn't? I mean, God could protect you on the mission field, but so, so, supposing He doesn't. Now, one Wycliffe missionary went down there to Columbia and found out God didn't protect him. He could have. He could have. I believe with all my heart, I don't think Satan could touch one of God's people unless God allows it to happen. I'm not worried about what man might do. I'm not worried about what they say. I'm not worried about the circumstances. Beloved, I know, I know my God is able. But supposing He doesn't, would you still go? Now that's something to think about. They said, look it, even if He doesn't, we're not going to. You know what he's saying? Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Get some old-fashioned determination in your soul and don't quit. I mean, just because the tide rolls in and the tide rolls out, I mean, be consistent. Get determined. Don't quit. Don't quit. Sometimes their offerings are up. Sometimes they're down. Sometimes the crowd's big. Sometimes the crowd's little. Preachers, we, we know that. But you know, there's some of God's people sometimes, if everything ain't running just right, they won't, they just gotta, oh, it's not worth it. Let me tell you something, brother, you stand if nobody else stands. You stand, stand therefore. I mean, when you've done all, stand. Don't quit, don't quit. Beloved, let me ask you a question very quickly. You raise your hand if you know the answer to this. How many home runs did Babe Ruth hit? Somebody, if you know the answer, raise your hand. How many home runs did Babe Ruth hit? There's only one fellow, Hank Aaron, finally beat him out in his lifetime. All right? He hit 714 home runs. Do you know how many times he struck out? 1,330 times. But you know nobody at all remembers that. You can always usually find a person or two that remembers how many home runs he hit. But nobody knows how many times he struck out. I mean, there was over a thousand times that he got up to bat, the ball was come by, and he swung, and he hit nothing but air. But oh, there were 714 of them that went clean over the center field bleachers, clean out in the street. Why? Because he didn't quit. And I don't know how many home runs you've hit for God, but don't quit, don't quit, keep going, get determined, and brother, hit all the home runs for God you can, because the game is in the ninth inning, it's about to end, and one day God's keeping the scorecard, and you won't have any more times at bat. It's getting down there, brother. I've struck out many a time. I struck out more than I'd want to admit I struck out. But keep on keeping on. Get determined. I mean, if the crowd's there, hey, man, go. But if they're not, still go. Get determination. That's what fortitude is about. And then we go on. The destruction. Notice the destruction of sin. It says, now they took him up. They tied him up. And they took him up, and the, and the king was so mad, he said, I want you to heat that furnace up seven more times. And they heated the furnace up, they tied these fellows up, tied them up in their clothes, and the Bible said that they've got some men to carry them up. I, uh, these fellows are probably big, strong fellows, and they carried them up, and they chucked them in the fire, and the Bible said that that fire was so hot. Notice what it did to those men that carried them up. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego it killed them why? they're on the outside fringe inside God done turned the thermometer the air conditioner on amen I mean it was nice and cool on the inside on the outside where it's dangerous brother don't try and get away from God get in there as close as you can I know sometimes the fire rages and the battle rages but the safest place to weather the storm is right in the eye they tell me in the eye of the hurricane is just a dead calm and in the eye of that furnace there sat these three men Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those men that took them up were slain. They were destroyed. And my friend, sin always destroys. Be not deceived, for God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth that, shall he also reap. 
And beloved, we've got young folks, and, and God knows we've got some good young folks, but I'll tell you, we've about lost a whole generation of young people in our, in our nation. And why? We can't blame it on the winos. We can't blame it on the pre We can't blame it on a thousand and one other things. The blame must be laid at the door of the church and preachers that tell the preach and won't preach against sin. And warn men and women, boys and girls, oh, you ought to thank God a thousand fold over. I know sometimes when your pastor gets done, it's like scalding hogs or something. But brother, he does it because he loves you. And you ought to thank God that you've got a man that's not afraid to preach the truth. There's a bunch of these Casper milk toast wishy-washy outfits not fitting to go out and wash pots and pans somewhere and just skirt the issues and skirt around things and pretend and play games while souls die and they go to hell and young people by the multitudes are swept in. There was an outfit down in New York. I was holding a meeting not far from there. There was a young girl and a boy that they had found, uh, they found him in an old, dilapidated, run-down apartment building, or what was left of them. The rats had eaten most of their remains, but they had been killed. And uh, the story came out in the newspaper, and it appears this girl, she was missing for quite a while. She had run away from home. She was about 15, I believe 15 years old, 14, 15, 16, and she ran away with some boy, and they went out there, and they found this old, abandoned apartment building. It was ready to be demolished anyway, and they took up housekeeping in there. They had an old flea-bitten mattress there. They had a little old bitty wooden uh, milk crate for a nightstand and just a little old bitty flashlight there for a light and one little alarm clock. And they were down there. They stayed for many days. But one night there was one of the roving gangs in that area that found out where they were. And they came down. They stuck a small caliber revolver in that boy's ear as they lay there sleeping, unbeknownst to them. And they pulled that trigger and sent that young man out into eternity, no doubt to meet God unprepared. And then they took that poor young girl and of course they did what several things a depraved mind could consider and think up to do and they abused that girl all night long and she screamed and she hollered and she pleaded and she begged for mercy but beloved the devil knows not how to pronounce mercy he doesn't know how to spell it he doesn't know what it means and there she was at the hands of almost literal demons and they abused her all night and there she was and I imagine she would that God and they were down there they stayed for many days but one night there was one of the roving gangs in that area that found out where they were. And they came down, they stuck a small caliber revolver in that boy's ear as they lay there sleeping, unbeknownst to them. And they pulled that trigger and sent that young man out into eternity, no doubt to meet God unprepared. And then they took that poor young girl, and of course they did what several things a depraved mind could consider and think up to do. And they abused that girl all night long. And she screamed, and she hollered, and she pleaded, and she begged for mercy. But, beloved, the devil knows not how to pronounce mercy. He doesn't know how to spell it. He doesn't know what it means. And there she was at the hands of almost literal demons. And they abused her all night. And there she was. And I imagine she would that God a thousand times over that she could have been home with Mama and a daddy that loved her and cared for her. But no, she didn't want to be there. And then they, after they got done, you see, my friend, the devil, he's not just Intent to ruin your life. He wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you. If you're lost, He wants to destroy you so you go to hell. If you're saved, He wants to destroy that life so that you can't do anything for God. And He'll do it if you're not careful. This young girl out there all night long and people heard her screaming five blocks away. They said, Why didn't you call the police? So we didn't want to get involved. And I'll tell you something, if we don't get involved in this country, we are very soon not going to have anything to get involved with. I mean, brother, the devil's about run away with the show. And God's people sit back and twiddle their thumbs and sing, I'm at ease in Zion, and the devil's walking away with the show. And oh, that poor girl, they came and on the way out, one of them found some, uh, uh, I don't know, it was a case of beer bottles or something. And I'll be honest with you, my friends, and I, I rarely, I, I, I believe I only use this illustration just a couple times. I rarely use it, but I'll tell you what. We are, we are facing a terrible foe. 
we're facing a thing called Satan. I mean, he's real. He's vicious. And I know all the world makes jokes about him. But, beloved, he's real. And he's vicious. And he doesn't love your children. He doesn't love you. He doesn't love your pastor. He doesn't love this church. I mean to tell you tonight, he hates your guts. he just as soon see you dead and see you in hell if possible. Hates you, especially if you're, if you're God's child. Oh, he can't get you in hell then, but boy, he wants that life. He wants that life. They took that girl and they held her down, and I don't know God being my witness. I don't know outside of demonic uh, activity how anybody in their right mind could be so cruel. They took that young girl and they took those bottles and they pushed them into her body one after another, after another, after another, after another. And she screamed and she begged and she pleaded and she cried, but there was no mercy. Then some little fancy damn flea-bitten preacher stand up and say, Don't get excited about sin. Don't try and scare people. Don't preach about sin. Beloved, Isaiah said in Isaiah 58 verse 1, He said, Cry aloud, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Not a fool, a trumpet. And show my people their transgressions in the house of Jacob their sins. And beloved, I'll tell you what long as God gives me air in these two lungs. As long as there's one precious little girl, as long as there's one sweet little boy, as long as there's one, I'll keep preaching, I'll keep warning, I'll keep exposing the Lord and devil for what he is. And every time I hear something like that, I say, oh God, forgive me. Forgive me for not preaching it more terrible than what it is. Sin tonight is terrible. It'll destroy you, friend. They performed an autopsy, I don't know, 18, 20 bottles they found in that girl's body before they finally took and put a gun in her head. And then she died, went out to eternity as far as I know, lost. But my friend, when that little girl got to hell and she wasn't saved, all of that suffering, and only God in heaven knows what she had to put up with that night. But my friend, I report to you right now that all of that suffering and all of that agony and all of that terror and all of that that she went through was nothing, nothing, nothing compared to the devil's hell that she found herself in. And she'll never get out of that suffering and torment. So the preacher said, hell's that bad, it's worse than that. It's worse than I could ever make it. I don't have the vocabulary. I don't have the speech to articulate to you the horrors of hell. And then her preacher got up. You know what that dummy said? God said, well, he said, I, I want to pray for uh, those folks. And they took a, he took up an offering, as far as my knowledge is of the situation, took up an offering for the defense fund. I'll tell you what, they need to give them 90 days in the gas chamber and string that turkey up by his toenails for about six months till he got some sense in his hand. Man, we're in a mess in our country. They take some of these rapists and these murderers and they take them characters and stick them in the gas chamber where they belong. Hey. We'd be a lot better off. I read in the paper this last character. I don't know what his name was over there in Indiana somewhere. Made him out to be a martyr. They said, oh, he is wanting to die still yet. So I'll tell you what, if Brother Jim was running the show, he'd have that wish fulfilled right quick like. Talking about the warden there at that, uh, that particular prison. Said he used to be a Methodist preacher. They didn't know if he'd throw the switch. I said, boy, I ought to write that fellow a letter. Tell him for a round-trip ticket, I'll throw the switch free of charge if they just send me a round-trip ticket. Say, you do that, preacher? Yeah, I'd do it. Lay down, sleep like a baby. Did you read what that man done? Did you read what he done? Did you read what he did to that woman and her three little children? Did you read that? Did you read what he did? One of the best things I read about it, there was one writer, he's a very liberal man, but because of that case there, he changed his opinion about capital punishment. He said, we've got to have common sense. He said, there's some of these devils, we've got to take them out of here. Amen. I said, amen, even if you are lost, that's good theology right there, brother. There's folks, they've laughed at the book, they've laughed at God, and now we're roofing it. Oh, the Bible said when a sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the Son of Men are fully set on them to do evil. Man, if they begin to dish out punishment. Most of these fellows, they know even if they do get the death penalty, unless they really request it, they know they're not going to die. Well, 
destruction. It'll do it. And then look at the delay, the divine delay. Verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell down bound into the midst of the burning fire furnace. Now, now friends, you know as well as I do, God could have kept them out of that fire. He could have. I mean to tell you, he, he's more powerful enough, but he didn't. Why? Why? I mean, God could have snapped his finger and killed Nebuchadnezzar dead. He could have wiped out that whole crowd. He could have just had him untied, and he could have did something, just done anything he wanted to and set him free. But he didn't. They went into the furnace. Why? Well, you see, there's some things in the furnace, beloved, that you don't find out in the lily patch. There's some things in the furnace that you don't find up in the garden. There's some things in the furnace that you won't find on the mountaintop under the shade tree. There's some things in the furnace that you don't find out yonder in the hayfield or in under an apple tree. There's some things in the furnace, and that's the only place God can show you. And beloved, as I said this morning, I've learned all my lessons in the valley, down in the furnace. They got in there, and notice what happened. When they got in there, they saw somebody in that furnace. I mean, brother, you might have to go into a furnace, but I'll grant you this, that God Almighty's already there just waiting for you. You just can't see Him till you get in the furnace. And those gentlemen wouldn't have took nothing for that experience. I'll tell you what. Later on when the king said, Hey, the deliverance part of it, you know, divine deliverance, the king said, Hey, come on out of there. I'll tell you what. I believe with all my soul God had to run them three fellows out of there. Oh, Shadrach said, now wait a minute, Lord, this is kind of fun. I, I mean, let, let us stay in here a little while. Oh, Abednego, he's chasing them around inside that furnace. I don't want to go out there, Lord, let me stay in here. Oh, Meshach down there crouching in the corner, hoping the Lord won't find him. But I'll tell you what I ever get where the Lord is, you got to beat me off with a stick. I mean, they got in there. They had the best camp meeting anybody ever saw. And beloved, when you get in God's perfect will, I don't care if it's in the center of the furnace like heaven. Amen. Amen. God can take an old grass hut over in Africa and make it into a palace for you. And He can take a palace if you're out of the will of God and turn it into a shambles and make you detest the day that you ever set foot in the place. But these men, they win. And God definitely delayed, but He did it for a reason. He had to show them some things. Oh, Peter said, Think it not strange, beloved, concerning the fiery trials which shall come to try you, as though some strange thing hath happened unto you. Knowing this, knowing this, that the trying of your faith is much more precious than silver and gold. You got something, brother, more precious than all the gold of Fort Knox. You got something more precious than anything in this world. And God sometimes heats up a person. You notice what happened to them? They had them tied up. And sometimes the devil, he gets us all tied up, get our hands tied up, he's got our feet tied up, gets our mouth tied up, we can't say nothing for God, we're scared of our own shadow, we're scared to tithe, we're scared to give, we're scared to go, we're scared to do anything. The devil gets us all tied up, and God just turns a furnace just a, just a little bit. He said, son, i got something for you. And pass you through that furnace one time, and notice when they came out, the Bible said there wasn't even a smell of smoke on them, what was gone? Them ropes they had them tied up with. The ropes! The bounds that Satan had them tied up with, that's what was gone when they came through the fire. I'm going to tell you, brother, their hair wasn't even singed. Amen? Amen. Their clothes, they had right kind of clothes. Their clothes wasn't even singed. Those fellows were right. And God sometimes delays. But I'll tell you what, when He does, it's for a purpose. It's for a purpose. God is never late. It's taken this preacher a long time to learn that. I'll be honest with you. Here sometimes I say, the Lord... Well, we're in a mess. You, you, you better hurry up, Lord, do something. But I found out God doesn't get in a hurry. He's always right on time. I mean, I tell you, I, I agree with old Brother Roa. Living by faith will give the flesh ulcers, and then faith comes along and heals the ulcers for you. I mean, sometimes when you get out there on that limb and you think, Lord, the devil will whisper in you and say, Man, God's dead. He's left you this time. I recall one time I was coming from California, had a meeting somewhere, and I had to leave my wife and children at home. I forget, I did not much money. Went out, got a few groceries and left, and uh, I had to go. I had 400 miles to go, and I didn't have enough money to get there when I left. But I knew, I knew God was in it. I knew God told me to go. And so I said, well, Lord, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to start. I'm going to go. 
Got down there near Dallas and my car blew up. And I'll tell you what, there isn't any five women in this church more helpless than Brother Jim when it comes to a car. I'm telling you, I ain't no, I can't screw a light bulb in without cross threading. I, I, they don't start with me. I get it. I know you get it. Boom. If they don't boom, then I'm stuck, man. I'm just there. I'm stuck. And I got up there and boy, I was running around real good, you know. I was going along and I said, boom. I said, hmm. <laughs> Pulled off the side of the road over there. I know how to do it, you know. I look like a man. I got out of the car, kicked the tires, you know, check around there, lift open the hood, you know, look in there. And I look, you know, it looked all right to me, you know. I know that's the problem. Sitting right there, all them wires and everything running everywhere. And I, I didn't know what the problem was. I got a fellow up in Alaska who's tried for five years to teach me how to change points. I, I don't see anything pointed in there yet. I don't see. He talks about a high side. I don't see no low side. I don't understand those things. But anyway, I was there and boy, I was stuck. And I, I sat there and, and I didn't even have a coat. And I, I thought down there at summertime all the time it was snowing. I was sitting out there and I said, boy, I said, Lord, we're in a mess. I said, now remember, Lord, you're the only reason I'm here. I said, I'd just as soon be back where I was. I said, brother, I said, now, Lord, I I've got us both in a terrible jam. I said, we, I always get to include the Lord in on it now, I tell you. That's why you better be sure God calls you where he calls you, because, man, when you get in trouble, you want to get somebody misery loves company, and I don't know any better company than the Lord. I said, now, Lord, we're in a mess. And, boy, the devil, he's calling me everything. But I mean, he called me everything in the world. He said, you're a fool. Since your God don't expect you to go off and leave your family with seven dollars. I said, well, God told me to go and God's got some money. I'm going to send them back some. They'll say, well, you're a fool. You're an idiot. I, I, you, know, you know how it does it in your mind. I'm telling you, man, just running me ragged. And I was in, boy, and I got out and, and uh, I said, oh, Lord, we're in a mess. I sat down in the car. And I'll have to admit, I got my Bible out. Swipped over there, Romans 8, 28. Hadn't faded a bit. Still there, bold, black letters, man. I mean, it was still there. And I said, Lord, I said, I know that's true. I said, the devil tell me it ain't. And I said, well, I, I said, Lord, I'm kind of shaky on this thing. I'm beginning to believe him. I said, you're going to have to do something, Lord. So I decided, well, the best thing to do, I'll get out and I'll go call. So I'll, I'll just get on the phone. I'll call somebody. I didn't know who was going to call. I didn't know nobody in Dallas. And I got out and halfway, to, I found out one thing. Listen, if any of you go to Dallas and break down, don't look for any phone booths. There ain't none. There ain't any. I walked all over that place. I come under a viaduct down there, and three of the biggest, meanest, ugliest looking dogs I ever saw in my life. Them dogs come out there, and they, I mean to tell you, I thought it was going to eat me up. And I said, feet, if you ever did something for me, it's time to do it now. And boy, I took off running, and, and I, I started up this hill, and I found, oh, it was a great old big stick. Boy, I said, praise God. I said, God have prepared a stick for Brother Jim. I said, this is it. I said, the odds are switching in my favor. I got that stick, and I said, all right, you coming dogs. I said, come on up here. I'm not a knot on your head big enough to hang a 10-gallon bucket. And dogs, they, they looked at that. I said, come on, I'll pump you on the head one. Well, old dogs, they turn around. I don't, I don't like dogs. I, I'll tell you, I was born and raised in the city, folks. I, I mean, I was 16 years old before I knew how milk come in this world. I thought it was made like automobiles for a long time. And I'll tell you, I, I don't like them dogs and things. But I finally, I said, I'm giving up on this. I said, this ain't going to work. I went back and I got and sat down in the car. I got to pray. We'll make a long story short. This fella come by and it just coincidentally happened to be a mechanic. Just a coincidence. Another coincidence, he happened to be a Christian mechanic. Another coincidence, he happened to be a fundamental independent Baptist uh, saved born again mechanic. And then he said, well, preacher, he said, we'll see what's wrong in this car. And he said, well, there it is. He said, just plain. And he said, it's a fuel pump. I said, amen, brother. I figured that's what it was. I didn't know what it was. I said, yeah, I said, it's acting just like that's what it was. And he, we got it. he laid in that cold snow and he took that thing off. He said, yeah, there it is, brother. I wouldn't have known a fuel pump had come and bit me on the nose, brother. I didn't know what it was. I said, well, what are we going to do? He said, well, we got to get us a new one. So I'm counting very quickly in my pocket. I, I know I got oh, I got about $7 left, something like that. I didn't know for sure. So we went on over to the parts store, and it was on Saturday. We, he drove me all over Dallas. We finally found a parts store, and we took that thing in and got that thing. We traded it in and got it on, and the fellow said that will be $6 and some odd thing. I paid it all up. I had one penny left to my name. And I looked up there and said, oh, praise God, at least I ain't broke yet. And I went back to the car there. And this fella, he worked on that thing. And boy, he got it done. And uh, he said, all right, said, preacher, give it a try. So I started, boom, boy, it went right up. I said, hey, man. I said, nah, I said, don't sound right. Shut it off. It sounded like music to my ears. 
I shut it off. He got in there tinkering around there. He said, try it now. Vroom. Boy, I mean, it ran like a sewing machine. Never heard it run any better. I said, brother, I said, that's great. I said, that's wonderful. And so he said, well, he said, preachers, now let me tell you, he said, it's getting, it's getting kind of late. He said, why don't you come over to my house? My wife has got some supper on. And I'm telling you what's the truth, brother. That sounded like a good idea to me. I felt the leadership of the Lord in that thing. I said, well... I said, I'll tell you what, I mean, I hadn't had nothing to eat, you know, I was, I was a hungry man. I mean, to tell you, my, I, my backbone's getting right through my stomach for non-support, you know, I was getting hungry. And I, I started to say, well, but God said, no, preacher, you got a long way to go. I said, I know it, Lord, but you look at that gas gauge, we ain't getting where we're going on this trip. I said, I think a full belly's better to go off on a, on a, on an ill-fated trip than nothing. I said, no, preacher, so you tell that man you can't. I said, well, brother, I said, I appreciate the invitation, but I, I better go. I said, I got to get all the way to Mississippi. I had about 400 miles to go. And he said, oh, preacher said, you can't make it in time to preach in the morning. It's too late. He said, come by my house and, and we'll call and we'll tell them. And then you can come in, have a good, good breakfast. You can have a, a good, a good supper. I'll give you a good breakfast in the morning. And then you can go and you can make it for tomorrow night. I said, boy, that sounds like good theology from where I'm. No, fellow, old tears begin to come down his face. He pulled out a wallet. I mean, one of Texas walls, but as big as a suitcase. I never seen nothing like it. He said, "Oh, preacher," he said, "I'll tell you." He said, "God's God told me to do this." He said, "I don't want to embarrass you." I said, "Embarrass me? <laughs> Go ahead, embarrass me." You know, I said, "Just embarrass me all you want to." I, I didn't tell him how much money I had left. He said, "Oh, he said, preacher, I, I don't. I won't embarrass you." He said, "Here," he said, "I got to give you something," and and he just took out a wallet of money and stuck it in my pocket. And I, he said, "Just add that to what you got." Man, that wasn't hard arithmetic, I'll tell you that. That was simple arithmetic where I stood from. And then he said, I, so I hugged him around the neck. We got down by the freeway and we had a prayer meeting. I mean, I don't know what folks thought driving by on that uh, Dallas-Fort Worth turnpike there. They were looking at us mighty strange. You know, they were slowing right down when they came by. And boy, I prayed and I asked God to bless him. And then I got back in the car. Man, I went on down the road. I was singing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I got yonder down the road about 15 miles, and I seen a, one of them hamburger places. I said, I feel strangely led to go get me a hamburger. Lord said, help yourself, son. I went over, I got me one of Texas hamburgers. I got me a big order of French fries. I got me a big old Pepsi Cola. Boy, I, I come out singing, the fight is on, praise God. The trumpet sound is ringing out. I got back in the car. I was driving down the road, and I was just having a good time, and all of a sudden it dawned on me. I hadn't heard from the devil. What's it, hey, Mr. Devil? <laughs> Amen. Uh, what's the matter, cat? Got your tongue? Huh? I said, uh, a few minutes ago, you was ready to run me up a tree. You told me God was dead. You told me God done forgot about me. You told me God didn't know where Dallas, Texas was. I said, now, Mr. Devil, I know I'm no match for you. I said, but I want to rebuke you in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to remind you, I am one of the elect. Amen. I got elected, folks. I didn't know I was running for anything, and I got elected. And I said, I'll tell you what, devil. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, now, if you want to know where my God is, if you want to know what my God could do, I said, well, you ain't out there pestering one of God's saints. I said, come here, stick your nose right in that pocket, devil. I said, God takes care of me. Well, I went on down the road, and I opened up over there to Revelation, you know, chapter 20. Sometimes, you know, I, I get some good messages while I'm driving. And I said, now, Mr. Devil, I said, I want to tell you what God says about you. I said, now, this ain't Brother Jim. This is what God said. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says, And then the devil, the devil which deceived them was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever. I said, now, Mr. Devil, stick your nose in that any time you get ready to. I figure you understand English quite well. I said, just read that and read it and weep because you're going to hell. You're going to the lake of fire. And I said, I'm still going to the glory land, praise God. I'm still going to the beautiful land where the milk and honey flow. And praise God, he cuts a little bit of the spigot on every once in a while down here too. What am I saying, folks? I'm saying God can take care of you. Uh, God can take care of you on the mission field. God can take care of you in Dayton. God can take care of you in Africa. God can take care of you in Alaska. God can take care of you in Mexico. God can take care of you anywhere under any circumstances because He's God. 
In Psalm 62, verse 6, All power belongeth unto God. Yea, once hath it been made mention, yea, twice hath I heard it. Oh, oh, power belongeth unto my God. Beloved, He's God tonight. I mean, put Him first. He's God. And He's always God. I'll tell you, He's God when you got T-bone steak. But He's God when you ain't got nothing but peanut butter and crackers to eat. He's still God. He's God if you got a brand new Cadillac to drive. He's God. One preacher told me, he said, I, I wouldn't have a Cadillac if I was a preacher. I said, listen, God, give me one. I'll drive the wheels off that thing, brother. you got one you don't want, give it to me, and I'll drive it to the glory of God. Amen. But if you ain't got nothing but a humpback mule, brother, he's still God. He's God when you got good health, and he's God when you're laying on the hospital bed. He's God when you're young and full of youth, and he's God when the almond tree begins to bud and the hairs turn gray. He's still God. Do you know him tonight? Do you know this God that I'm talking about that gives fortitude? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A lesson in fortitude. Let's pray. Our Father, tonight we thank you so much. We thank you so much for your mercy and your grace and your goodness. And Father, it never ceases to amaze me of the blessings that you give us along the way. Father, I thank you for these folk here tonight. Lord, I thank you for this meeting. Just been three days, but my, it's been good, Lord. It's been good for me anyway. I, I, I've enjoyed myself, Lord. I really have. I've enjoyed myself. I've enjoyed the fellowship. I've enjoyed preaching to these folks, even though I can think of a dozen other preachers that could have done better, brother. I can think of many of them. But Father, you have ordained and you, uh, you knew a million years ago we'd have the service tonight. You knew I'd be here. Father, you knew everybody would be here. Now, tonight, I pray that you open up the hearts of these people. If anybody's lost, Lord, I pray that they'll accept this Jesus, this God we've been talking about, that can give them, Lord, give them and answer all the problems that they might have. And I pray you give your people a Holy Ghost boldness and an unction from on high. And Lord, in these last days that they'll stand with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and all thousands upon thousands of other saints of God that have stood the test down through the years. God, give us fortitude, I pray. Help us to stand for you. Lord, help those maybe they're drawn a little cold and indifferent. Speak to their hearts. Now, while our heads are still bowed, and I'll ask our sister to come to the piano very quickly. While she's coming, our song is going to get a song to sing for us. I want to ask you a question. Is everybody here tonight saved? I didn't ask you where you go to church. I don't care if you go to this church. Now, I can highly recommend this church. If you're born again, if you're saved, you want a good Bible-believing, I mean Bible-preaching, Bible-practicing church, I highly recommend this church and this pastor. But he's no more interested in you joining this church than I am when it comes to salvation. My friend, you can join this church and you'll die in your sins and go to hell if you're not saved. I wonder tonight, are you born again? If anyone at all say, Brother Jim, tonight I'm not saved. I don't know where I'm going when I die. I think I might be on the road to hell. Maybe you don't know one way or the other, but say, Preacher, pray for me tonight. I'm lost, or I'm not sure if I'm saved or lost. I want you to pray for me. Just quickly raise your hand in Lord. I'll pray for you before we go home. Anyone at all. Man, woman, boy, or girl. Thank you, I see that hand. Anyone else? Thank you, honey, I see that little hand. Anyone else? All of you adults are saved, born again. You know you're going to heaven. Anyone else? Thank you. I see those hands. Anyone else now? All right. How about you Christians? Everything between you and God all right? You've been standing for the Lord. Remember, we're not talking about doing better. We're just talking about doing those things we know to be right. Stepping out by faith. Living by faith. Trusting God. And doing those things that God's led you to do. My friend, let me tell you something. I, I don't pray about tithing. I do it. I can't remember when I've ever prayed about getting up on Sunday morning and coming to church. I don't pray about that. I do it. There's many things you don't have to pray about. If you're not doing it, you know you're wrong. You know you're wrong. You know it's right to tithe. You know it's right to come to church. You know it's right to read your Bible. You know it's right to pray. And if you're not doing those things, then quit hiding behind some cloak of religion and thinking everything's all right when it's not all right. My friend, I'm asking you tonight. Say, preacher, I'm, things, God spoke to my heart tonight while you've been preaching. You say, I'm saved, but God's really spoke to my heart. I want you to pray for me. Thank you. I see that one. 
I see that one, ma'am. I see those in the back. I see these over here. I see that one in the back in the middle. And this one here in the, in the front. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you, ma'am. I see that hand. Son, I see your hand too. I see yours, honey. You can put it down. Anyone else? I pray you pray for me tonight. God really spoke to my heart. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that honesty. Ma'am, thank you. I appreciate that. Anyone else? I see that one in the back. Thank you, son. And this one up here. Ma'am, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, I appreciate these over here. Any, anyone else? Say, Brother Jim, pray for me tonight. God spoke to my heart. Folks, this thing, as I sung that little song, it's not a game. I mean, this thing is real. And, and if the Lord's not the most real, vibrant thing in your life, now I'm not talking about always walking on the mountaintop. I'm, I'm not always on the mountaintop. I mean, there's valleys we pass through. I don't always walk around with a smile and a spring in my step. But, brother, I'll tell you what. I know that I know that I know that I'm born again. And I know I'm serving my Savior. And I'm going down the road doing the best I can living by the light that God's given me. And I know at this moment, at this moment, at this moment, there is not one thing that I am conscious of not one thing that I'm conscious of that's between me and my Savior. I try and stay paid up, prayed up, and ready to go at any moment. And I'm asking you tonight, anyone else, say, Preacher, God spoke to me. Thank you, son. I see that one. Pray for me. Thank you, sister. I see that one. Anyone else? Say, Pray for me, Preacher. Thank you, honey. I see your hand in the back. Anyone else? Thank you, children. I see your hands. You can put them down. Thank you. Our Father, tonight, Lord, we bow this unworthy head before heaven's throne to thank you again. For the precious blood i thank you father tonight lord for this this group of people that's here lord everybody far as we know confesses and professes to be saved there's many that have raised their hands many precious little children some of these young folks and then some of the adults that have raised their hand tonight that you spoke to their souls now father whatever the problem whatever it might be Whatever the besetting sin might be, whatever it is that might be between them and your absolute 100% perfect will and your absolute blessings, I pray tonight, God, that you give them victory, absolute 100% victory tonight. I pray, Father, that not a person, not an individual will leave this building tonight without having everything between them and you fixed up like it ought to be. Again, bless this church, Father. Oh, God, might you rise up a hundred more just like it in this area and other areas. And, Father, bless this pastor and give him wisdom and encourage his heart, Lord, as he goes along the way. And, Father, tonight I pray that you'll do the work that you've promised to do with your Holy Spirit as we give the service into your hands now. In Jesus' name, amen. My brother, what number? Page 282. Let's stand together. We're going to have an invitation. Most of you are probably aware of how an invitation is run. If you've been to this church before, I know you've seen an invitation. We're giving you, we're inviting you, first of all, if you're lost, to come to Jesus. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you come. And if you're a Christian, and if you raised your hand, and God, there's something God spoke to you about, then you come. You come if you need to come tonight. While we sing on the first verse, my brother. My burden was so heavy, and no one seemed to care. My life was filled with sorrow, I fell on my knees in prayer. But when I called in secret on heaven's glory line, it was there I got an answer. Heaven answers right on time. I just heard from heaven. Jesus answered on the line. I just heard from heaven. Now my troubles are all behind. I just heard my Savior whisper. My child, you're not alone. I just heard from heaven. And everything is all right now. Paul and Silas had been beaten, many stripes along the way. When from their inner prison at midnight began to pray. But when they started singing, prison doors were open wide. They had heard from heaven. The power of God was on their side. I just heard from heaven. Jesus answered on the line. I just heard from heaven. 
Now my troubles are all behind. I just heard my Savior whisper, My child, you're not alone. I just heard from heaven. I just heard from heaven. I just heard from heaven. And everything is all right now. I've been on my way to heaven for a long, long time. And many things have happened that's clouded up my mind. But I am more determined to walk the narrow way. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. There's a golden street to walk upon, a bell I'm going to ring. A band of angels in the sky, I want to hear them sing. There'll be a lot of friends awaiting when I walk through the gate. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. I've been through lonesome valleys, I find the highest hill. I've known the joy of living in the center of God's will. I've watched the angels come and take my lovers home to stay. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. There's a golden street to walk upon, a bell I'm going to ring. A band of angels in the sky, I want to hear them sing. There'll be a lot of friends awaiting when I walk through the gate. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. There's a golden street to walk upon, a bell I'm going to ring. A band of angels in the sky, I want to hear them sing. There'll be a lot of friends awaiting when I walk through the gate. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. Wall of on the Isle of Patmos, Isle of Patmos. John beheld the glorious, glorious sight, a number which, a number which no man can number, man can number. Praising God, praising God both day and night, both day and night. These are they, these are they who won the battle, won the battle. These are they, these are they who stood the test, who stood the test. Loving God. Spotless, pure and spotless, the redeemed, the redeemed, the pure and blessed. Nevermore, nevermore will they no hunger, they no hunger. Nevermore, nevermore will they no pain, will they no pain. No tears will ever, no tears will ever dim their vision, dim their vision. No sacrifice, be said again, be said again. These are they, these are they who won the battle, won the battle. These are they, these are they who stood the test, who stood the test. Loving God, loving God, it's pure and spotless, pure and spotless. The redeemed, the redeemed, the pure and blessed, pure and blessed. Yes, the redeemed, the redeemed, the pure and blessed. I read about a man one day, wasted not his time away. He prayed to God, he prayed to God every morning, noon and night. He cared not for the king's decree, but trusted God to set him free. Oh, Daniel prayed, oh, Daniel every, prayed morning, every morning, noon and night. Oh, Daniel served the living God while here upon this earth he taught. He prayed to God, he prayed to God every morning, noon and night. He cared not for the things of Baal, but trusted God who never Oh, Daniel prayed, oh, Daniel prayed every morning. Morning, noon, and night, they cast him in the lion's den because he would not honor men. He prayed to God. He prayed to God every morning, noon, and night. Their jaws were locked, it made him shout. God soon brought him safely out. Oh, Daniel prayed. Oh, Daniel every prayed every morning, noon, and night. Oh, Daniel served a living God while here upon this earth he trod. He prayed to God. He prayed to every God morning, every morning, noon, and night. He cared not for the things of Baal, but trusted God who never oh, Daniel prayed. Pray, oh, Daniel prayed pray pray in the morning, noon and night. Daniel served the living God while here upon this earth he trod. He prayed to God, he prayed to God in the morning, noon and night. He cared not for the things of Baal, but trusted God who never. Oh, Daniel prayed, oh, Daniel prayed in the morning, noon and night. Out on the hill. Glory land, so happy 
and free at God's right hand. They tell of a place through marvelous grace called heaven's bright shore. Pilgrims of earth someday will go to live in that home forevermore. By trusting in him who died for sin and rose from the grave. Oh, heaven's bright shore, there'll be no dying over there, not one little grave in all that fair land, not even a tear will dim the eye, and no one up there will say goodbye, just singing his praise through endless days, on heaven's bright shore, that heavenly shore. When I must cross that rolling tide, someone will be on the other side to welcome my soul to that fair land made perfect by love. As I walk up that milky way, I'll see that homecoming in a ray. How great it must be for angels to see a pilgrim reach home. On heaven's bright shore, there'll be no dying over there. Not one little grave in all that fair land, that wonderful land. Not even a tear will dim the eye, and no one up there will say goodbye. Just singing his praise through endless days. On heaven's bright shore, that heavenly shore. On heaven's bright shore, there'll be no dying over there. Not one little grave in all that fair land. Not even a tear will dim the eye, and no one up there will say goodbye. Just singing his praise through endless days on heaven's bright shore. God good, good to give, give us so many blessings undeserving, that's what we are, we ought to thank him, love and praise him, a little more today, a lot more tomorrow, for forty long years God's children journeyed in the wilderness, searching for Canaan, that best his promised land. They never went too hungry, nor never got too thirsty. But the more that God kept blessing them, the more they would complain. Ain't God good, Ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving? That's what we are. We ought to thank Him, love and praise Him. A little more today, a lot more tomorrow. In the times that we live, so many are unthankful, and many more they fail to see that God has given all. Never having time for God, they're always busy working to pay for cars, new homes, TVs, and carpets, wall to wall. Ain't God good, Ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving? That's what we are. We ought to thank Him. Love and praise Him, little more today, a lot more tomorrow. Ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving? That's what we are. We ought to thank Him. Love and praise Him, little more today, a lot more tomorrow. The blessed Savior wrote my name when I was born again. He wrote it when he saved my soul. He wrote that I had made a right my every sinful wrong. He wrote my name on heaven's road. He wrote my name, my name way, up, way up, up, up in glory land. He saved my soul, Jesus saved my soul. from sin and shame. From sin and shame. I never shall. No, I never shall. Yes, Shall we give the name of the blessed Savior, wrote my name. 
I'll be no stranger when I reach my home in glory, then my name is Sid. The book of life, the message saved, your own queen, he saved my soul, from sin, he saved my soul, from sin and strife, he wrote my name, my name, way up, way up, up, up in the glory land, he saved my soul, Jesus saved my soul, from sin and shame, from sin and shame, I never no, shall, I never shall, forget shall forget the name, the, the blessed Savior wrote my name. If I should live a thousand years upon the circle, though I never could forget the day that Jesus wrote my name within the blessed book of life and took my many sins away. My sins away. He wrote my name, my name way, up, way up, up, in up in glory land. He saved my soul. Jesus saved my soul from sin and shame. From sin and shame. I never shall. No, I never shall. Shall we the day the blessed Savior wrote my name? He wrote my name. He wrote my name. My name. Way up, way up in glory, up glory land. He saved my soul. Jesus saved my soul. From sin and shame. From sin and shame. I never shall. No, I never shall. Shall we the day the blessed Savior wrote my name? He wrote my. Name. Someday the stammering tongue will falter no more, and the grander, sweeter song I shall sing. For I'll join the ransom choir on heaven's bright shore, forever to praise the King. And while the I'll keep on praising Him, and my voice will never tire or grow, and my song shall ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me, and I'll sing it while ages shall roll. When I'll meet years have passed in that wonderful place, my song of praise will just have begun, for my joy will never end while I look on his face, and my song will never be done. And while the I'll keep on praising Him, and my voice will never tire or grow, and my song shall ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me, and I'll sing it while ages shall roll, and I'll sing it while when life for me on this earth is ending and I'm facing this chilly time, I'll be farewell to my friends and loved ones till we shall meet on the other side.